Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of the Vegan Body Coach Podcast. I'm extremely excited to be doing this one with you. It's going to be a little bit different. Um, again, we're in a solo episode situation. For a bit of context, we've uh, here in New Zealand, we have just come out of what we call Level 4 um, lockdown as a response to the coronavirus which means um, we're still pretty much in isolation. Um, there's a few more things open now. Um, however, majority of us are trying to stay at home and practice social distancing as, pos- as much as possible. Um, and for myself with my gym, we're still not open yet. So it's a case of uh, continuing to train at home. Um, I've been lucky enough to come in and do a few sessions on my own here at the gym. I've just finished up a really good upper body pull session, which has been super cool. Um, but yeah, we're still sort of stuck in uh, isolation at this stage. Um, so we don't have any in-person interviews for you this week, but I do have a few in the, uh, in the bank that I want to put out over the next month or so. So watch out for those ones. They're super exciting. Um, there are some bangers in there that you'll love. And then, you know, once this whole thing quietens down a little bit and we can get back in some travel, I'll be looking at doing another podcast tour in Australia. Uh, and then later in the year, hopefully getting over to the UK and meeting up with a few people over there, a few exciting opportunities. So today, let's keep things casual again like we have over the last couple. And um, I thought it would be super interesting for some of you to hear my story, to hear my journey. Um, I've never sat down and fully laid it out and sort of told someone my full journey through to where I am now in terms of uh, my health and fitness and in terms of my veganism. Um, it's something that I'm super passionate about and I would love to share it, but um, I'd much prefer to interview people rather than share about myself. But I thought it might be interesting for you guys and help us to keep growing this community, the vegan body coach community, and ensure that we are a little more closer, a little more close that, so you can know a little bit more in depth about me, my past, my history, and get to know me a little more. And that way we can converse at a deeper level uh, when we do connect on the different platforms so i uh i hope you do enjoy this episode and we can sort of dive straight into it but before we do um i just wanted to quickly do something super cool and read out a couple of reviews from our from the apple podcast um, store or app um you know the, the reviews that we get are really the lifeline of a podcast it's it's how we get seen and it's how we get found when people are searching for a quality podcast um so I've got the uh, the Apple Podcast app open at the moment, and there's um, a bunch of reviews here. So thank you so much to the people that have reviewed, and I wanted to read out a couple. I might do this every episode and just you know give you some recognition for what you've done, and, and I may at some stage in the future come up with some kind of reward system for giving us a review on iTunes and um, give you something back in return because it definitely is um, it's humbling to have someone review the podcast and give us a five star. Um, but it also does, yeah, again, it really does help the podcast to be seen. Um, so first of all, this one I think is from Zach James. Um, he says, this podcast is honest. No, this podcast is hosted by an honest, open and authentic dude, Humble AF. Features some really cool personalities and we're only a few episodes in. Thank you so much for that one, Zach James. I really appreciate um that review and I really appreciate uh, you being open about how you found it and it sounds like uh, it's it's uh, hit home for you and, and giving you what you need which is super cool and I love to, to hear people's feedback about the podcast. Another one here is from NZ iPhone fan, um, <laughs> I don't have your name there, um, says love this podcast and have definitely hit the subscribe button for further episodes. Thank you for subscribing, please do subscribe guys. Um, that way you can get the latest episodes when they come out and uh, you can sort of um, make sure that you listen to them, make sure you get the content. And uh, I do love to see these episodes, uh, sorry, these reviews. So please guys, if you haven't reviewed, go ahead, jump on the iTunes app and give us a five-star review. It's super easy to do. It'll take you two seconds and it will just help me out a whole bunch um, to keep growing this community, which is what this is all about. Hey, but let's move on. Let's give you some Let's give you some details. Let's give you the, the in-depth knowledge around Jackson and his journey to where I am now. So um, for me, it all starts in 1989. <laughs> we don't have to go back that far, but that's when I was born. Um, grew up in New Zealand, obviously, as you can tell by my accent, um, and you know, 
growing up was was you know just the, the, the standard New Zealand sort of way of living. Um, we in terms of our, our meals, just the standard way that New Zealanders eat. New Zealanders eat you know summer barbecues, sausages on the barbecue. We have the standard meals that most of you probably had growing up. Um, my mum is a phenomenal cook, by the way, um, and. Yeah, it wasn't anything crazy. I, I do have like vivid memories of going down to the local river and we had sort of beach style uh, cook-ups on a campfire, just creating the fire on the beach there and, and cooking sausages. And that was what, like one of my fondest memories is cooking sausages on the beach. And that was always a staple for us, these pork sausages. And in terms of our, our diet and what we ate throughout my, my growing up days, it wasn't meat centric meat mad or anything like that it was sort of just your standard diet and we would have meat at most meals for sure um, particularly um, dinner uh, however the lunch times we probably have like you know have a classic steak and cheese pie or whatever uh, for lunch and breakfast was generally just a cereal or toast but so it wasn't like crazy we were trying to you know stash heaps of meat but we definitely enjoyed our barbecues we definitely enjoyed our chicken um, I, I used to love having a steak when I go out to meals and things like that. Um, I was pretty much unaware of anything to do with the food system, like most kids are, right? I mean, very few kids are, are aware, and it's well, especially when I was growing up, there wasn't the amount of information out there. We didn't have social media, we didn't have websites and things like that to go and find stuff. So you just kind of lived your life based on what was given to you, which is how most of of history has been has unfolded, right? Um, but then as you know as I grew up a little bit more and we have we have cousins that have a dairy farm in the Taranaki region and um, we used to go there a lot and play on the farm and hang out and and you know that was just the, their way of living and uh, and still is um, but I do remember vividly at one point um, you know often when well always when uh, the mother cow gives birth there is either a female or a male obviously now the the males they call bobby calves. I'm sure you're aware, and those bobby calves are loaded up, you know, a few days after they're born and taken away, and and they are usually um, killed very soon after for veal and sold as veal, um, or they might be taken and fattened up and used as a beef herd for for further consumption later. Um, but I vividly remember um, being told not to go down and watch the bobby cows be loaded into the trucks uh, because they didn't want us to see that as kids and so from from then i was like oh what the you know but that sparked my curiosity i wanted to actually see it so i'm pretty sure i did go down and remember seeing these guys these these big strong guys jump out and basically grab these bobby calves and just throw them like like a like a rugby ball into the back of these trucks and you know I remember just being pretty torn up by that and seeing that kind of um, treatment of, of an animal. And I had no idea they were going off to be slaughtered or anything like that. I had no idea the whole system. Um, but that was a that was a um, sort of first, maybe one of my first intros to, you know, the treatment of animals and things like that and was largely unaware of what else was going on. Um, you know, but, but throughout my years growing up, we probably did have a few veggie meals here and there. Like it wasn't something we were avoiding. I'm sure mom used to cook up a few veggie meals. And I remember even in my teenage years, we used to love having falafel and things like that. So it wasn't like we were anti-vegetarian or anti-vegetables. We had a really good um, sort of balanced diet, I would say. Um, but definitely enjoyed, you know, dairy. Definitely enjoyed our ice creams. Um, I've, I remember our... Um, uh, having like ice creams a few nights a week after dinner and um, mum would always make an ice cream cone for our dog at the time, Ella. Um, so we, we definitely liked our dairy um, as probably most Kiwi families do. Um, but yeah, I, I want to I fast forward a little bit and it probably it probably wasn't until around 2009, 2010 while I was in my, um, my early years of my army career um, that I got crazy into... Uh, animal products and meat intake and that was largely in response to my obsession with the gym I was just starting to get into the gym and and reading the muscle magazines and watching some YouTube videos back then uh, when YouTube was first just starting around how to build muscle effectively and of course what what came out was you need to eat a lot of meat 
you need to eat a lot of eggs, uh, you need to drink a lot of milk, um, anything to get your protein in. So during those days, I was having crazy amounts of meat. I'd have chicken breast for lunch every day. Um, I'd be having egg white omelets in the evening. Um, I would have you know even a, an egg bagel or something in the mornings. Um, a lot of protein shakes, whey protein shakes. Um, I remember having cottage cheese every night before I went to bed. And what I would do is I'd get a scoop of whey protein. I'd put it into the cottage cheese and I'd kind of like let it melt in the microwave. So I'd have this like creamy, cheesy, chocolatey pudding. It was it was the weirdest thing when you think about it now. But those were things that we were being told to do from these magazines. And, and because it was casein protein, it was slower digesting. And it would help you gain muscle overnight and all these things. So... Meat was a huge part of my diet at that stage, and um, and it was the same thing on deployment as well. When I was in places like Egypt, um, I did a, a bit of time down in Antarctica, where I remember the food at these places was amazing. By the way, because it's run by Americans, um, so if any of you Americans out there, you guys know how to provide for your people. Um, but I remember, you know, having just ample choice of as much meat as I wanted at each meal. Um, Whereas at the New Zealand bases, we would only be allowed to have one meat choice per meal. So if there was a chicken choice, there was like a beef stroganoff, and then there may be like a, some kind of curry. And you'd have one choice out of all of those. But on my deployments, for example, in Egypt and Antarctica, it was eat as much as you like. Um, so I would go crazy on like lean turkey and lean chicken and eggs and all these different things and I'd be stashing in as much protein as possible so I vividly remember that so I was eating a lot of animal products at that stage um also I loved my dairy love ice cream um so that was a big part of my diet um and at this time I was also really involved with hunting um hunting was a passion of mine from a from a young age I didn't really do it from a young age but I was always interested in it from probably about 13 years old and um, you know, got got an ear eye foil and progressed up to getting my firearms license and started buying different weapons um, and going out hunting. And so during my army years, I'd go out into the bush and I'd do deer stalking. Um, and these were really enjoyable times for me, very challenging times because you're out there on your own. You're you know you're hunting. You've got everything on your back, um, your food, your water, your camping supplies, and you're out there in the bush alone for a week or so. Um, and these were definitely challenging times, and they. Um, probably helped me a lot, but at the same time, um, yeah, I was shooting and killing animals, and um, this was a, a great enjoyment for me. But at the same time, um, I've had this discussion with a few people recently that I didn't actually love the killing side of things. I love the hunt. I love going out there and having that kind of like I'm providing for my family, or or I'm sort of you know following that age old tradition of going out and hunting and and. Uh, you kind of like, I don't know, that masculine type thing going on. Um, so I loved the hunting. I loved the the whole getting, you know, geared up in your camouflage and carrying a rifle. And I loved all that side of things. But at the same time, when it went to come, when it came to pulling that trigger, that was actually always quite hard for me. I didn't love, I hated actually to see animals suffer. So for me, it was all about a clean kill, one shot. Um, and if it wasn't a clean kill, it was my, it was basically my, um, what's the word? Basically, I was trying as hard as I could to, to, to end the animal's life without it suffering so much. So if I did wound an animal, it was a case of trying to get there as fast as I could to, to sort of end his life, end his life and, and stop the suffering. And that was, you know, that always ripped me up as to see an animal suffering, um, from a a wound so you know <clears throat> i often i often think maybe i was just a vegan at heart pretending that i like to hunt um and you know who knows what the underlying theme there is and where that sort of came from my desire to hunt in the first place but during this time i was i was hunting and um and killing animals and um so if we fast forward a little further um where vegetarianism or pescatarian came in for me um was I'd left the army and I was a personal trainer, had my own little gym and at that stage I was following some people online and I'm pretty sure, I'm, I'm, it's it's hard for, for me to remember now, I mean I think this was 2000, maybe 15, um, where I was following uh, two people, um, Daniel and Bailey and 
Rob Bailey. Um, if you don't know who they are, you can go look them up. Um, very, very prominent people in the fitness industry. Um, Dana Lynn Bailey, you know, used to do competitive um, physique uh, and won Miss Olympia. And Rob and, and Dana, they, they own Flagnor Fowler, a, um, a clothing company and a bunch of other companies as well. Um, however, at the time, they had just gone pescatarian. I saw it in one of their videos. They said, you know, we're doing this pescatarian thing and... And at first, I was just like, they didn't really say much about it. I was like, what is pescatarian? So again, sparked my curiosity. Um, I think I, I like to learn things. I like to know what's going on. So <clears throat> went and had a look and, and had a look around and see what pescatarian is. Um, and at that stage, I don't even think I'd heard the word vegan before. I probably knew what vegetarian was. But, you know, during my army years, if, if someone had come up to me and said, hey, I'm vegan, I'd be like, first of all, what is that? And second of all, don't talk to me like you know i'd i would have been completely opposed to the idea um but because they had influence in my life already just because i watched their videos and i used to um sort of take inspiration from them i guess um they influenced me with the idea of cutting out meat products so at this stage i was already a personal trainer as i said so i was focused on health in some aspect but still eating a lot and uh, i mean a lot of animal products um specifically a lot of whey protein um so yeah they went pescatarian so i thought hey what is this thing how to look into it um and i don't know if that stage i really looked much into the whys i must have had a little look into why they might have done it um and had a had a look into maybe some of the animal welfare stuff but i don't know i think i guess i always had a, a knowledge of the connection of the fact that an animal had to die for it to end up on my plate, where I think a lot of people have no connection there whatsoever because they've never gone out and done it themselves. So all they see is meat in a package in the supermarket, neatly wrapped, nice and clean, no hair on it, no blood. They see that, they take it, they eat it, and they've never seen the process of how it gets to that point. Whereas I, through my years of hunting, knew exactly what that process was, and I'd done it myself many times. Um, So I knew how gory and dirty and unnatural it is for humans anyway so for me i had that connection there already i knew the connection between meat and on my plate so it wasn't a case of like having this light bulb moment of like oh my gosh this is where my meat comes from i knew where it came from but i probably didn't quite know the extent of what factory farming was and the exploitation of animals, how that affects many different systems, um, and how it affects the individual animal. Um, so I may have gone and looked into some information there, but I'm not not too quite not quite too sure. However, I did give pescatarian a go, and I must have done it for a few months. Um, and I remember going out to dinner and just having like prawns and having a lot of seafood. Um, but I probably didn't find it that hard because I did rely quite a lot on eggs and dairy for my protein. Um, and it was, I think, I think from there, this was around this time when Cowspiracy came out. Now, I don't know if I watched Cowspiracy first or if I watched Earthlings first. Um, however, I remember watching Cowspiracy one night. I was, uh, I was staying at my uncle's place. He had given me the house for the night. And I, I put it on the laptop and I watched it. And after Cowspiracy, I mean, I think a lot of you are the same. Some of these documentaries are very convincing. And uh, I remember watching that and sitting there thinking, okay, that's it. Um, I'm vegan right now from today forward. And um, I don't believe, yeah, I must not have gone that far um, as to actually implementing that. But um, that film did have a massive impact on me. Um, and if you haven't watched it, it's about the environmental side of um, of our of our food system and of our animal agriculture. So incredible watch. But I remember watching that and thinking I need to do something. Um, and then at some stage within the same period, I watched Earthlings. Now, I think a lot of you may have watched Earthlings. Uh, whether you got through or not is another question. I remember watching Earthlings. I, I was eating some food at the time. I think I was eating some protes. And um, had to stop eating because it was, it's yeah, it's a really rough watch. Um, I did, I didn't actually finish Earthlings. I got maybe halfway, three quarters through, and decided to um, 
to finish it there um because you know i would seen enough and it was enough to make me want to change so i think from that point on it was vegetarian so fish was out seafood was out um and it was a vegetarian from then on so i did the vegetarian thing for about a year um and yeah didn't find that hard at all again a lot of my protein was coming from dairy and eggs so as long as i could keep that in there i'd be fine and full disclosure i had no plans of going the next step and becoming a vegan i thought that was too extreme i thought hey look if you are reducing your impact on the environment number one and on animals through reducing well through cutting out meat and cutting out seafood that's as far as you need to go i was like if you want to be vegan that's cool but i'm not creating any harm on these animals so for me number one is animal welfare right i'm i'm a huge animal lover we've grown up with animals our whole lives um and i have incredible connections to animals when i meet them see them touch them so for me that was huge number one animal welfare but i was like hey look i'm not endangering animals i'm not uh harming animals if i'm eating eggs because they're just laying eggs anyway um or if i'm drinking milk because they just produce milk right so why don't we use it what it's there to drink it's there to eat um let's just continue doing that we're not killing the animals we're not harming them and so that was kind of my defense that was kind of my wall um and i didn't really want to look too far further than that so fast forward a year on i was a vegetarian for a year and uh myself and my girlfriend at the time sat down and watched i'm pretty sure this was a plant-based news um they do these end of year little mini documentaries and if you haven't seen them they're really really good they're about 50 minutes long um they kind of cover the the full details of what happened within the year um for the plant-based community so the, the the pros and the cons of what's happened in the media and what's happened in legislation and things like that so we watched this little end of year doco and on there was this video and this really, really impacted me. It was probably the catalyst for the biggest change. Um, it was the image of a farmer going into a paddock with a quad bike and trailer and he picked up the calf, a newborn calf, put it in the back of the trailer and drove out of the paddock. And as he left that paddock and drove along the fence line, I vividly can see this now as this mother cow literally running, if not sprinting, after this quad bike and trailer calling for her baby and the calf calling back, separated by this fence and watching this cow run. Now, if you've never seen a cow run, it's not graceful. It's definitely not natural. They're not made to run. They're not a good runner. But when you see a cow run after its child, you suddenly realize maybe these guys have some kind of connection that's deeper than we thought. Maybe these guys are do have feelings to a deeper level. Maybe they do care. Maybe they do love just like we do and if you switch out the cow and you put a human it's horrible when you think about it someone rocking in there taking away a newborn baby never to be seen again and then extracting the milk that was supposed to go to that baby so that we can have ice cream or we can put milk in our coffees and so that hit me really hard so again the animal welfare was a huge thing for me so seeing that happen to to a cow and kind of making that realization that we're doing this and my purchasing of whey protein, my purchasing of milk, this is all contributing to this exploitation and these atrocities that are going on. So it was a combination of watching that and then another little YouTube video I, I got sent or I watched, which was called Dairy is Scary. I can't remember what the girl's name who did it, this blonde American girl. Um, she did a video called Dairy is Scary, and that outlines sort of the details of the dairy industry. And being from New Zealand, dairy is our, is our biggest sort of export, um, and it's sort of the largest part of our economy is, is dairy farming. And so to be confronted with that, of what's actually going on within our, within our food system in regards to dairy, um, 
was was really confronting. It was really challenging to see and to watch and to understand. So I took that and I decided, okay, cool. It was uh, the beginning of, I believe, 2018. Was it 2018? Yeah, beginning of 2018, I think Veganuary had already finished and it was Feb. So I said, okay, cool. I'm going to do a 30-day February vegan challenge. And I announced it to my gym members and everything like that. I said, this is what I'm doing. You can follow along. I remember going to have my final meal before I started this uh, this Veganuary. Not Veganuary. I started February vegan. Um, was at Denny's. I went to Denny's and I had a, I think I had this hot fudge sundae, which is this beast calorically dense filled with cream and ice cream and hot fudge it was just insane but I remember having that as like my final meal uh, because I knew the day after that I wouldn't be having any more dairy so anyways did a 30 day vegan challenge not not difficult at all um, and saying that girlfriend at the time incredible cook was cooking up some amazing meals of tofu and tempeh and, and I'd already had a lot of that being a vegetarian anyway um, but it was just a case of substituting those those dairy options and those egg options for for plant-based alternatives, which initially is, you know, it's a it's a change, and of course every change is hard, and there is things we have to adapt to. Um, we have to shop a little bit differently. We have to look into different things. We have to start looking at packets and looking for milk solids, which, as you probably know, are in everything. Um, you have to be a little more aware. But I don't think it was that hard. And you know, once that February was up, it was just carried on. You know, it was like, what's the point of going back when I'm already here? And I've I've now been awakened to these these atrocities um, that are happening in our food system through factory farming. Once I was awakened to that, it's like, well, why would I go back to being vegetarian and contributing to this? Um, so that was kind of my journey to veganism now a lot of the time when someone asks you okay so you went vegan so what what differences did you notice were you did you have more energy did you recover better like all these questions and i'll give you a bit of backstory at that time i was tracking my nutrition intake very religiously um i probably tracked on my fitness power for maybe two to four years you know, without having a week off type thing, you know, a few days missed here and there, birthdays and Christmas and things like that, but I tracked pretty religiously, so I knew my nutrition inside and out in terms of how many calories I was taking in, protein, carbs and fats, so when I decided to go from vegetarian to vegan, I kept the calorie intake the same, I kept the protein intake the same, I kept the carbs and the fats the same, so in terms of the total intake of food that I was taking in, there was no change. So it was just this swap in the food source. So instead of having whey protein, I started having a vegan protein, a pea and rice mix. Instead of having, you know, dairy milk, I started having almond milk or soy milk. So these are some small changes. And so in terms of energy levels, I didn't notice a difference. Um, I was eating the same amount of food. So there wasn't really any massive difference. Maybe if I was thinking about it, I wasn't actually sort of sitting down and assessing myself and going, okay, do I feel like I have more energy or not? I sort of was just going through it and doing my thing. So I don't remember having um, enhanced energy levels like a lot of people do feel. I know this is very individual. So some people who go vegan day one and, you know, they come from a perhaps um, less healthy version of a diet, a more westernized, hyper-processed um, nutrient void type diet beforehand they might go vegan and notice some massive changes in terms of energy levels because they you know they're getting rid of a whole bunch of junk they're putting in some nutrient dense foods um, increasing fiber they probably lose a little bit of weight as they start to increase the food volume without the caloric density of those foods um, but yeah in terms of energy levels didn't notice massive difference didn't notice a massive difference in recovery so I was still recovering the same for my training because my training didn't change. So, you know, often when people claim that they've, you know, had these massive differences once they've gone vegan, I don't know, you know, it's very hard to tell because it's an N equals one scenario is anecdotal. It's very hard to tell if, you know, was it the, t- the fact that they cut out animal products? Is that the reason they had more energy? Is that the reason they recovered more? Or is it the fact that they changed something else? Did they do more training, less training, more sleep? Did they hydrate better? All these things come into play. Um, 
for digestion, on the other hand, I noticed a massive difference. So my digestion sped up dramatically. I was hitting the bathroom <laughs> quite often. Um, and, you know, I think with specifically meat products and dairy and eggs, I think it slows things down quite a bit. Um, and so for me, that digestion just sped up massively. Um, muscle mass was the same because, again, taking the same caloric intake, same protein, and hitting the same kinds of training. However, I probably wasn't hitting a optimal amount of amino acids per meal to maximize muscle protein synthesis at that time. Um, this was before I'd done a bunch of my nutritional studies. So I probably didn't know the in-depth stuff around amino acids at that stage. Um, but at the same time, I was still eating a total, a high total amount of protein per day. So probably around 160 to 170 grams of protein per day I would have been taking in. Um, probably a decent amount of that was coming from shakes at the time and protein bars. Um, but, you know, the other things that did change massively was, you know, socially. So going out to meals, you know, telling people that you're vegan, getting into those discussions, um, making adjustments at restaurants, making adjustments when you go away with friends. So if you're going away to a batch, you need to implement some strategies so that you've got food there ready for you. You can't just turn up and expect other people to cater for you. You need to take your own or do a shop, um, you know, give people the option to have a vegan meal with you. Hey, I'm going to cook a vegan meal tonight. Do you want to try it? Do you want to join in? Um, these are good ways for us to make it a little more normal for for a, a vegan meal to be out there. And a lot of my friends at the time had eaten vegan meals with us already and and, and knew that they could be tasty and, and filling. Um, but of course, socially, things do change. And then with family life, of course, things are going to change a little bit. And I think initially, you know, I'd already gone vegetarian for a while and that was a big shock to, you know, especially my mom as a as sort of the main cook of the family. She was an incredible, is an incredible cook. Um but because she's so incredible and so creative, it's very, very easy for her to switch from a home-cooked, say, chicken-based meal and switch it to a veggie-based, a, a legume-based, or even playing around with tofu. Um, you know, she's incredible at doing those types of things, um, bargain hunting for vegetarian sausages and things like that. So she's always been incredible like that. But I think initially, of course, there's a bit of a, a pushback there. Like, why are you doing this? I think a lot of it, uh, and I know Earthling Ed speaks quite well about this, is, you know, you're you're basically saying, hey, look, what now morally I believe that what I was doing for those 23, 24 years of my life was wrong, which is basically like telling your parents that you – that they raised you wrong, right? They were giving you meat and now morally you think that's wrong. They were giving you dairy, they were giving you eggs and morally think that's wrong. Obviously, they didn't have the information and now it's our job to provide that information and allow them to make up their own mind and to, to change when they're ready. Um, but I think there can be some pushback from, from specifically families and it's a lot harder in those close-knit situations where you love those people um, but at the same time, there's that friction there. So we have to be aware of that. We have to be very mindful of that. And I think, you know, initially I probably, and I still do have some some issues with that um, because of the fact that I'm so passionate about this as specifically from the animal welfare side of things. You know, my family are massive animal lovers. We all love animals. We all have animals in our homes, whether it's cats or dogs. Uh, Mum grew up riding horses, you know, so we love animals, but it's trying to get them to see that the the difference between the cow behind the fence and the dog in our home is what's well the, the, the difference is nothing but the difference that we've been led to believe is that one's for eating and one's for playing with so you know often i can get frustrated i'm human just like anybody else and get frustrated and can't get my head around why they continue to eat these foods when they know now the the truths about what's happening in the industry but at the same time, forcing change is no way to to get the result of change. We have to put the information out there and we have to be an influence and a positive influence at that and allow change to happen when people are ready. And some people may never be ready, um, but it's not our job to 
I guess, get hot and bothered by it to create arguments. Um, we had a good discussion about this with episode one with, with Chris Tan about how to effectively engage with, with non-vegans. Um, and, you know, I've had some conversations with friends and family in the past that have got heated and I've been argumentative. Um, and, you know, because we believe in these things, right? We believe that this is the right way to do it and we can't understand why other people don't want to get on board with it. And I've had those conversations and they never end well. Every single time I leave feeling worse, I leave feeling like I've let myself down and I've let my family or my friends down by having that heated discussion. Whereas if we go on from another angle and said, hey, look, this is my journey. This is my story. This is what I've noticed. These are the things that I've seen happening in the industry. This is something that you might not know about. And this is the changes I've made because of it. And here are some benefits as to what I've experienced personally. And people love to hear stories. That's why I'm sharing my story today. Is people love to hear the story of what you experience. So I think we have to come at it from that angle. Be smarter about it. Come up with uh, come at it with empathy. You know that's what we're doing when we are taking, excluding, or reducing animal products from our diet. We're practicing empathy, and you know we're putting ourselves in the shoes, in the hooves. <laughs> Um, of these animals, right? We're saying, hey, look, I get what you're, what you're going through and, and I want to help you and I want to change it for the better. So we have to do that with, with our friends and family as well. We have to we have to put ourselves in those shoes. You know, we, we were all there at one stage as well. I was there um, completely oblivious to what's going on, completely oblivious of what veganism is. Um, you know, if someone had come to me in my during my army years and said, hey, look, you're going to be a vegan one day. And, you know, the old stereotype of the vegan with the with the dreads and the hippie clothes and tie-dye clothes and kicking a hacky sack in the park, like, and, and one of those skinny sort of looking like they're about to, to cark it, you know, that was my viewpoint of what a, a vegan was for many years. And I would never have gone there. But now I think through what I'm doing and many other people like me are doing, is putting out a different view of what a vegan can be. A vegan can be strong, healthy, can be fit. Vegans can be cool, right? They don't have to be weirdos. <laughs> they don't have to be screaming at you on the street with a sign. I think there's there's a uh, there's a way of activism that works for all different people. Um, for me, seeing the Cube of Truth or um, Anonymous for the Voiceless. Um, make the connection guys any of those activism type groups on the streets showing you video footage of factory farming and things like that that gets me that would have absolutely if i've seen that years ago that would have got me right there and then i would have looked into it more myself um because seeing exploitation and um abuse at that level that makes me want to it gets me. It gets me fired up, and it makes me want to make change. So, that absolutely gets me. But I get it that a lot of people, when they see that, that's a complete turn away, um, and they will walk straight past and claim ignorance. So, for those types of people, there's a different form of activism that might work for them. Films like What the Health, even though I don't agree with uh, a lot of the things that they, I guess, displayed within that film. And the way they did it, the same goes for the Game Changers. Um, these films do an incredible job of bringing awareness to veganism. And they do an incredible job of a form of activism that reaches a lot more people that might not, that might be turned away from the animal welfare side of things. So the health aspect, people love to think about themselves. They love to... To see how they can improve themselves. That's why self-help is such a massive industry. Um, so, you know, there's a basically what I'm saying is there's an activism for everyone. And the way we do things, the way we uh, speak to our family and friends is so important to figure out, okay, what is going to help this person see this from the right angle? What's going to help them change long term? Um, and it's just about planting that seed. You know, you don't have to change them on the spot. You might plant a seed and just say, hey, this is what I'm doing. And then six months later, they might watch a documentary. And then a month later, they might meet another person that is vegan and think, oh, that's cool. And then maybe another day later, they will go on Instagram and find someone that they think is really influential 
and find out they're vegan. These are all seeds that we are planting, which lead to someone transitioning into a plant-based diet. So I'll leave that there, my little discussion on activism. But I think you know it's just important to realize that we can all, we can all, uh, we can all, we can all make an effort to do our bit in this whole thing. Um, and there's a way that you can be an activist too in your own in your own individual way so you know during these during these periods even while i was vegan my initial year or two of vegan i still didn't have a massive issue with hunting so i still enjoyed it as a hobby i didn't do it very often i probably did it once or twice per year um just because of my location and i had other things going on i was building the gym and building my personal training business and things like that but um it was something that I was like, hey, look, maybe maybe I can be vegan and then if I hunt because I'm going out there on my own and I'm not paying a, uh, I mean, my, my big issue was with factory farming, so I'm not paying someone else to do it for me. Um, you know, it's very, I don't know, like earthly, I guess, in a way, like you're, it's you against the animal. Of course, we've got the upper hand because we've got rifles and high-powered scopes and things like that. So, you know, it's definitely not a, it's not a, an even sort of field there but I thought it might have been okay you know I was doing it um, on my own doing it for myself um, and not paying someone else to kill an animal for me so I was still doing a little bit of hunting but um, you know I think probably even maybe only a year ago I decided hey look I'm actually going to stop that you know I remember going out hunting and we we're going out for we we're shooting ducks and we didn't actually shoot any ducks but um, we didn't get any opportunities or we missed um, but I remember thinking, oh, like I'd see a duck flying over and I remember thinking, I actually don't want to shoot that duck. Like nothing in me wants to kill that duck right now. I don't need it for food. I don't need it for protein. I don't even like love the taste of duck. I'd never really buy it if I go to a restaurant. But the reason, the only reason I was out there because I do enjoy firearms or I enjoy weapons. Um, and I still thought I enjoyed hunting. But now, on the inside, I guess where I'm at now is that if I don't need it for any kind of nutritional reason whatsoever, there is no reason, no valid reason for me to take a life. Any life. doesn't matter. If, if pe- you know, people love to run over possums on the road in New Zealand. You know, I remember as a kid, <laughs> like swerving to hit possums, right? There is no need to take a life in any sense. Now, obviously, this I mean, there's a whole other discussion here, and I don't want to go into this, but there's a whole other discussion around animal con- conservation um, and pest control. And I'm not going to go into that discussion right now because I, I don't have all the answers there. But, you know, my, my viewpoint now in terms of hunting is, look, I don't need to take a life, so I'm not going to take a life. And it's not going to make me feel any better. I'm not going to enjoy the experience. Um, so now I think if I ever do want to, because I still enjoy the experience of hunting, going out, but I think if I ever want to do that again in the future, I might just take a camera and see if I can get some really quality shots of these beautiful living sentient beings as opposed to extinguishing their life for my own gain. So moving on from there, you know, we're talking about 2018 or so now and I decided to improve my nutritional knowledge and I signed up to a course called MNU, Mac Nutrition Uni. This is a uh, UK course um, started by a guy called Martin McDonald. Probably a lot of you guys are already following him. Um, but they do an incredible one-year nutrition course. And this is basically everything you need to, need to know to work with clients nutritionally. You don't need to do a four-year degree. They take all of the stuff you'd learn from that and then put it into a much more practical course that will you know, give you what you need to be working with different populations whether it's clinically or whether it's you know your your average general population person or whether it's bodybuilders or elite endurance athletes or whatever it may be so i did this course um and it's not a vegan course at all it's you know they promote um probably not promote that you know they basically look at the evidence and and put it out there for you to decipher i guess and a lot of the stuff is around you know we want to increase protein intake and um you know there's a lot of animal foods are high in protein and intake and blah, 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 right? So it's not a vegan course at all. I don't think it's, a, it's definitely not a biased course and it's not a pro-animal 
uh, product course at all. It's all about working with people. So, but one thing I did notice throughout the course was the reoccurring theme of the importance of plants in your diet. And, you know, though that wasn't the the main focus, you know, for a lot of the strategies we use with clients, um, having a high amount of plants in your diet, there was just so many benefits for it. And, and you know, no matter what the the clients we would be working with, whether it was someone who was obese and, you know, trying to get their the weight down so they don't have to have surgery or whether it was someone who was, you know, a, a middle-aged mom who's had three kids and wanted to get back to a, a, a point where she's healthy again and feeling good about her body and she's not only focusing on her kids but she's focusing on herself or whether it's the bodybuilder dieting down for a, a competition on stage and they're trying to get to 6% body fat. So no matter the person we're look, working with, we always have a focus on including plants and specifically fiber into their diets to increase not only the nutritional content of their food, but increase the satiety of their food as well. So their feelings of fullness after each meal, and this is huge in helping with weight loss and weight maintenance, is increasing the volume of that food without the caloric density of the food. So we see this recurring theme of like, hey, have plants with every meal, have vegetables with each meal, have fruit with each meal. All of these things are used in nutrition globally. Um, so I see these recurring themes through there, and I did really well throughout that course, and and um, really happy with the the content that they taught me. Um, and now with my own clients, I don't work with only vegan clients at all. Um, I work with a lot of people that aren't vegan, um, but I think majority of people are open to an increase of plants in their diet. Um, but at the same time, I do promote the use of more uh, more plant foods and a variety and a diversity of plant foods in their diet as well for all those benefits, for the increase in fiber, for the increase of uh, phytonutrients, for the increase in um, satiety that you get from those meals. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I do now with clients. And I mean, I love to work with vegan clients and, and you know, going forward from here with a vegan body coach. Um, with my coaching side of things will be a lot more focused on the uh, the the complete vegan or plant-based side of things nutritionally but at the same time I do work with people that aren't vegan because those are the people we can create big change with and those are the people that are going to help us to get uh, to where we want to go with this world um, in terms of increasing plant consumption so yeah once I've been doing my my coaching for a little while, um, running my gym here in Auckland, I sort of got to the point where I wanted to do something more in line, more aligned with this this newfound purpose, this purpose of I want to impact more people to make a change in their diet towards towards increasing plants. And this is where Vegan Body Coach came from. And it was about a year in the making. It's something I wanted to create for a very long time. And I spent a lot of time thinking about what I was going to do with it. Um, I absolutely loved and have loved podcasts for probably the last four plus years. Probably one of the original podcasts I started listening to was Danny Lennon's Sigma Nutrition Radio way back in the day. Um, and that's one of the sort of the original really well done podcasts that's been around for a long time. So I always knew that that was something possibly that I wanted to to have a go at myself was doing a podcast. So the idea of Vegan Body Coach came about and the podcast is sort of the the way that I can connect with as many like-minded people as I can, um, selfishly go and talk to people that I've always wanted to, to, to converse with and to put out quality information that's, you know, hopefully unbiased, hopefully... Well, I can't say it's unbiased. There's definitely an agenda there um, because we want more people to eat plants. Um, but at the same time, I want to interview more and more people that have a handle on the research and they can look at the research from a largely even perspective, a largely unbiased perspective where they can see things for what they are. They can read the research and go, this is, this is our best uh, interpretation of that. So I want to interview more and more people like that that are across the spectrum of training, nutrition, lifestyle, um, and bring out quality content that is 
uh, going to help you, the listener, improve your life as well. So that's really the that's really the the, the whole thing behind vegan body coaching, and in the future, the vision for for it in the future is to number one is to launch what I'm calling the the vegan body club, which is basically a a group coaching plan. Um, that's something I wanted to be launching in the future, and I'll have more details about that um, in the ne- in the in the coming months. Um, that's really going to be sort of the main way I can actually help people personally with their diet and with their with their training. Um, that is a massive passion of mine is actually coaching people through this to help them. Um, but at the same time, continuing now my my podcast tours. So getting back over to Australia, doing another tour over there, getting over to the UK, getting over to the US. Um, back to Bali and and doing these podcast tours where I go and I travel and I meet with these people Um, and I love hearing people's stories hearing their insights into training and nutrition and relaying that information to you I kind of think of myself as a middleman right and so I'll, I'll read the research reviews and see what's come out recently and then distill that down into information that is easily digestible by you right and whether this is through having a a podcast interview with a clued up researcher or whether it's having uh, putting out content on the Instagram or putting out video content whatever it may be it's about being that middleman between the top down sort of research and then distilling that down into information that is practical right and so that's it that's really what I want this whole thing to be about is a, a a no BS approach to training and nutrition it gives you the practical stuff that you need i think there's so much stuff out there at the moment that's just kind of like airy fairy or it's too in depth um maybe it's too nuanced and people just don't know what to do with it but if we can make this all about being practical what we can implement in our day-to-day lives to enhance our training to enhance our body and our physique and whatever goals you have around that how can we do that on a practical level? So I think, I hope you've noticed that on my Instagram is that what I post is generally very practical information that you can implement on a daily basis. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's really what Vegan Body Coach is all about. And um, I'm going to continue doing that this year. I'm super excited for all the guests that I've got lined up. And I hope you really do enjoy those those conversations as well. But at the same time, it just it also gives me a chance to, to travel more, which I love to do, um, to go to these different cities and try the the vegan food that's on offer. And, and that's actually one of the, my, my biggest joys these days is to, to go to a new city, to train in a new different unique gym um i hate going on uh, to to places and training just generic chain gyms i love to find something that is new and it's unique and it's fresh um a place where people are doing things differently so wherever i go it's always about trying out a new gym but then at the same time it's about going and trying some amazing vegan food as well so i can sort of combine these loves uh, when i travel is to go and train and then go and eat and then go and interview someone and put that content out for you. So this is kind of where I'm seeing myself going for the next year or so, launching the Vegan Body Club, um, continuing to build my gym here in Auckland. Um, and then in terms of my own training, my own training goals, uh, moving forward, I guess, you know, right now, as you probably know, I'm in a bit of a gaining phase. So I'm putting on a little bit of weight. The goal is always for me to to produce the best physique I can. So I don't really have massive strength goals. I've never been a super strong person naturally. Um, I think a lot of that comes down to my proportions and my limb lengths, um, but then also maybe, you know, muscular density and my starting point. Um, there's a lot of different factors that go into that. Obviously, the genetics is a huge part. Um, so I've never been super strong naturally. So for me, it's about, okay, cool. I know that I can build muscle. It might not be as fast as other people, out, outliers that you see on Instagram, um, you know, but for me, it's about comparing my starting point to where I am now and if you see my initial photos you know from my early teenage years and my first years in the army in my early 20s you know the, the difference over the last nine years of training is quite staggering um, but you don't see that when you look at the day to day you have to go back and look at your starting point and where you came from so you know I'm always trying to to improve on that and to build my physique to what I think it can be so going forward continue on this gaining phase and then I'll be doing a little a little uh body fat cut um around the probably august october mark probably around eight to ten weeks that i will cut for bring the body fat levels down again after a gaining phase um and that will coincide nicely with the next journey retreat and uh journey retreat um is a 
retreat I went on last year in Bali. And this is actually um, a combination of journey retreats teaming up with Plant Proof, so Simon Hill. And I went on that one last year in around October or November and thoroughly enjoyed it. It was definitely the highlight of my year. A week of incredible group training. Some of the hardest training I've done in a very long time. Um, incredible food. I mean, the food is just outstanding. The The chef there is a local guy and he just cooks the most. It's, it's all vegan, by the way. He just cooks the most incredible vegan food. Um, and you just spend a week there training, eating, sitting by the pool, getting a massage. Um, you know, we watched the game changes there. Um, you know, drinking coconuts by the pool. It was, and, and you're surrounded by 30 plus like-minded people. Um, and I made some lifelong friends there, which I'm super stoked about um, and connected with people that I never thought of I would uh, connect with. So, and, you know, so that's kind of a, where this year is going and I'll be cutting for that, leaning out, going to the, uh, going to the retreat, doing some more content over there and getting some interviews in while I'm in Bali. Um, and then seeing where the rest of the year takes me. Um, but that's sort of my, my uh, sort of short-term training goals from now. Um, yeah. What else do we need to cover here, guys? Right, this podcast is getting kind of long. So <laughs> we'll wrap it up real soon. But um, I guess really quickly, I need to discuss how vegan veganism, how me finding veganism has improved my life. And I think number one... <coughs> I think number one, veganism has increased, it's enhanced my nutritional knowledge on so many levels. Um, you know, not only me going and studying nutrition, but, you know, all the nutritional stuff that we have access to now on social media, on blogs, on YouTube videos. If you want to read the research, you can. If you want to watch some documentaries, you can. There's just information everywhere. And it often gets to the point where it's information overload. I totally get that. Um, but yeah, the, the enhanced nutritional knowledge is huge. I've learned so much and I continue to learn as I go further into my sort of vegan journey. I'm learning more and more about the, the health, health aspects of going vegan, um, about the environmental aspects of going vegan. And, you know, there's so much more to learn and, and understand around sustainability, um, around, yeah, climate change, around the, the impacts of uh, transportation, the impacts of, of growing food locally. Uh, there's so much to, to dive into. Um, and on the health side as well, you know, there's a, there's a ton of stuff to, to look into. And, and I love learning about this stuff. And I think this has been, you know, the most incredible um, journey so far, learning more and more about this stuff. It's, it's, veganism's also enabled to be more, enabled me to be more creative so in the kitchen now i'm trying foods i never would have tried before i've experimented with hundreds of different plant foods and there's just endless options available to you and i'm a much better cook now than i ever have been because i've sort of started to understand the fundamentals of how do you make something taste good right how do you use onion and garlic and how do you use spices to make things taste good so learning tons watching my man gaz oakley as he continues to put up incredible video content about cooking and um so trying some of those recipes and trying some of the recipes that you guys send to me i love seeing that so if you've got if you've got a high protein recipe that you want to send me flick it through and i can give it a go and i can share it around as well um definitely since being a vegan i've become much more of a foodie no doubt i think i think anyone who's not a foodie and by, by foodie i mean someone who's loves going out to try different foods and loves to play with foods and and enjoy beautiful meals. Um, I think a lot of people just eat because it's there and they don't really think much about the food and they're distracted while they're eating. But practicing that mindful eating and, and enjoying meals out with friends, I think, yeah, I've become a massive foodie since being vegan. I think <clears throat> I think going vegan, you, you can't go vegan without becoming a foodie. So there's a definite positive. Um, connecting with people, you know, connecting with the best people. Vegans on, on a whole... I've yet to meet in person a vegan that I don't like. I know there's a lot online that portray a not so desirable image of what a vegan is. And, you know, I've yet to meet someone though in person that is, is a horrible person. So it generally, you know, if you go to vegan events, um, vegan festivals, if you go to these retreats, 
man, there, there's just some great people out there. So, you know, go out and meet some of these people, go to some of these um, um, get-togethers, potluck dinners, cooking tutorials, things like that, a great place to meet other like-minded people. Uh, but I think a massive one is, is for me, veganism has given me a sense of purpose, you know, beforehand I did have purpose in terms of, hey, look, I was coaching people, helping people, I was building my gym, these are all things that gave me huge satisfaction in life, but the purpose there came through when I've, now I've got something that's actually going to hugely benefit not only the planet, but it's going to benefit animals' lives long term, and I can now use that sort of knowledge I already have of nutrition along with training to to put out information that aligns with my values, aligns with my morals. Um, and that gives me huge satisfaction and purpose. I have a incredible satisfaction now after each meal because I know every time I eat a plant-based meal or a whole plant... <laughs> I don't like saying plant-based because it's not plant-based, it's only plants. So <laughs> when I eat a plant-only meal, I just feel so satisfied that one i'm filling myself with the most nutrient dense health foods that i can find on this planet and two every meal that i eat that is not animal products is positively influencing the industry for the better and i'm hopefully saving some animals lives and positively influencing animals lives and i think that gives me huge satisfaction and huge joy that I know that just through just through choosing a different meal, just through having almond milk over normal milk, just through cooking up some some uh, tofu instead of having chicken, it's so simple, but it gives me so much satisfaction that I'm contributing in some way in such a simple simple and effective way. And I think lastly, veganism has it's given me awareness and it's awake it's awoken me awoken awakened i don't know how to say that i've become much more aware of the other issues we are facing globally i think once you look into and you understand the issues we're facing with the animal agriculture and with the environment you start to look further into other areas that we can improve on as well um whether it's indigenous rights, you know, um, it's it's racial awareness, um, sexism, uh, what else? You know, I guess environmental aspects of, you know, how we're using plastic, um, how we're using fuel. There's just so many other issues that I've become much more aware of now than I ever would have probably ever found out about just through being aware of one thing i think automatically if you are inclined to if you're cur- if you're curious about how things work and what goes on in the world and want to understand um, why things are the way they are i think you're going to be you're going to be woken up to a lot more that's going on in this world that we need to change and that we need to work together on as well so i think that's a massive positive is that you know the more we learn the more we can implement and change in our own lives to to work for the greater good and the betterment of humanity as a whole and you know, we we likely won't um, ever get to the point where we are covering all bases. There's always something more we can improve on. And just remembering that it's not about being perfect. You know, there's things we can change that are simple. There's other things that are maybe harder to change. That whether it's due to our, our socio-economic status, whether it's due to where we are in the world. Um, these different factors, uh, whether it's due to our upbringing. You know, there's some things that we, we will find harder to change than others. But I think if we're all working towards changing what we can and doing our best in that sense, um, that's all we can ask. So I guess wrapping up now, guys, um, I hope you enjoyed that little spiel. I think it was very long-winded and maybe a little bit disjointed. I do have some notes here that I'm sort of reading through, as you can probably tell. Um, but I actually find this really hard to, to talk long-term, long, for a long time about myself. Um, <laughs> it's actually really tough. Um, so maybe maybe at, at some stage in the future, we can have someone um, interview me as well. Uh, but I think uh, going forward, guys, I've got some great podcasts coming up. 
So be on the lookout for those. Um, what I want you to do is let me know where you are listening from. So if you're listening to this episode, take a screenshot on your phone, post that on your Instagram story, and let me know where you're listening from, what what area in the world you're listening from, and what you're doing while you're listening, whether you're driving in the car. Don't, don't do that while you're driving in the car. But whether you are out walking the dog or you're training in the gym or you're laying at home on the couch and you're listening, I would love to know. It really interests me as to who's listening and where you're listening from. The thing with podcasts is you don't really get a lot of feedback. You don't really know who's listening and where they're listening from because you can't see that information. Although I probably can have a look in the analytics and see some of that information, but it's, it's a little more in, impersonal. So I'd love to see who you are and where you're listening from. So do that. Do me that favor. Share it and um, let me know where you're at. And um, also, flip me a message if you've got any recommendations for someone I should interview um, anywhere in the world that is clued up in terms of science-based, evidence-based training, nutrition, lifestyle, maybe it's a chef, whatever it may be, maybe it's a business owner, anyone that has some influence and you would like to hear their, their point of view on something, um, flick me a message. Let me know who that person is and what you'd like to hear. And I would love to try and team up with those people. I mean, I've got a massive list myself, but hey, look, we've got a lot of time and we can interview a lot of people. So let me know who that is. Lastly, of course, if you haven't already, flick us a review on iTunes, five stars if you can, and uh, let me know how you enjoyed this episode. Linked below, there will always be, not always, but for now, there, off, off the back of my last episode about weight maintenance tips, in the episode description below, you'll be able to find the link to grab your free copy of my 11 weight maintenance tips. Um, and within that PDF, you can get the full details on how to calculate it for yourself, calories, macronutrients, all that kind of stuff, and then some tips on how to do it tracking and how to do it non-tracking. Um, so go grab that. It's for free. You can grab it, and it will just also allow you to sign up to our, uh, no, I don't want to call it a newsletter, sign up to our email list where I can send you the information about the new episodes, what's going on, um, coaching, different things like that. Um, no spam, just just let you know what's going on. Super simple. Apart from that, guys, I hope you're well, safe, wherever you are in the world. Um, hope you're spending time with your loved ones, doing something you enjoy, making sure that you are implementing some super health-conscious meals, um, experimenting, having some fun, and overall just practicing, practicing some, some self-care and some self-love during this time. Thank you so much for listening through this point. If you're with me, I do appreciate it. Um, and I hope we can connect on the social media platforms. All the best, guys. Much love. Peace.